Hey, as uh, Garen said a few minutes ago, if you did not get a My Mission card, we need one per person, not one per family or one per couple. So if you breathe, you need one. Now, let me tell you how we're going to use the cards, and then we're going to jump into the teaching. There are 10 spots on one side, and so the first thing to do is just to print your name at the bottom so you know who it belongs to. The only person that's going to use this today is you. So I'm going to tell you exactly how we're going to use it, and then you can decide whether you want to participate or not. But if you don't get the instructions down from the beginning, you won't be able to participate at the end. So about six or eight times during the teaching today, I'm going to stop and say, who does that remind you of? Or who has a situation in their life like that that you could pray for? Somebody who's far from God, somebody who has no hope for the future. And I'm going to want you to write down their first name. And that's all, just their first name. And we're going to pray over them at the end. Now I'm going to invite you to come forward and pray over your list. I'm going to pray over you while you pray over them. Because prayer makes a difference in people's lives. It really does. All right, so that's how we're going to use that. So as Garen said, um, I'm the team leader for the Northwest Ministry Network. We're about 350 churches. We go from the uh, Pacific Ocean to the Montana border and from Oregon to Canada. So that rectangle is kind of our world. And we've got about 1,400 ministers and missionaries that live in that area and a variety of them. And it's been fun to watch your church journey over the last six or eight years together. You face some significant challenges. God is helping you. I hope you feel like God is helping you. All right. You know what I really, really like? It? This is, I, I was with uh, some of you a number of years ago, but not in this building. You know what I like about this building? This is a building that used to celebrate death that now celebrates life. I like that. I really do. Um, New Testament churches have always just used whatever buildings or gathering places were available. In fact, I have a picture of an ancient building in the third century where so many of the cult worshipers who went to that cultic building came to Christ that the cult went out of business, and you can look at the side of the building where they scraped over the cultic symbols and began to put Christian symbols because a building is neutral, right? It can be used for something good or something evil. This is a place to gather for God's kingdom to move forward. So I'm going to pray. We're going to jump in. Jesus, thank you for bringing us together. Speak to our hearts. Cause us to be closer to you an hour from now than we are right now. In Jesus' good name, amen. So I want to talk to you today about the prodigal sons. There are two of them. It's not the prodigal son. There are two boys in this story. So we're going to zero in on Luke chapter 15. You can turn there in your Bible, but I'm also going to put all the scriptures on the screen behind me. Now, I am indebted to an author by the name of Tim Keller and his book, Prodigal Sp- Uh, the prodigal God, where a lot of research from this message came from, and I want you to know that. Did you know that 200 years of the church, the first 200 years of the church, Christians were called atheists? In fact, in the Roman stadium, while there are being uh, put to death, whether uh, sword or wild animal, animals or whatever, that the crowd would cheer, death to the atheists, death to the atheists. Well, it goes back to this story of the prodigal sons that Jesus told because it shifted culture. The way that Christians thought about God was so different than the Roman mind, they couldn't comprehend it. Imagine a conversation where a Roman citizen looked at a Christian and said, where is the temple that you worship at? And the Christian responds, we don't worship in a temple. Well, if you don't worship in a temple, where does your priest offer sacrifices? And the Christian would reply, Our priest doesn't offer sacrifices. In fact, our high priest is the sacrifice. 
He offered himself. He said, it doesn't make sense. And Jesus began to shift culture about how we think about God beginning with this story. So in this story, I want to share with you three things. Number one, we're going to get a new picture of God. Number two, a new picture of sin. And number three, a new picture of salvation. So here's the story. Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, in Jesus' day, if a father had two sons and the, the father died, they would receive an inheritance and the older son always got twice as much as all the other brothers. Now, the reason for that is he had responsibility to care for the family. So, the younger son says to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Now, what is missing in this story? What's missing is that the father is still alive. Usually, when you get an inheritance, you can't talk to the person who gave it to you. They're dead, right? Isn't that fitting in this building? Okay, just moving right on. So, think about that. So when Jesus told this story, there's this crowd of Jewish people listening to him, and he said, a, a boy went to his father, the younger son, said, Father, give me my inheritance. The crowd would have gasped. Because that's the equivalent of a young son looking at his father saying, I wish you were dead. I want your stuff but I don't want you. Now, if you think that caused a gasp in the crowd, because the rest of the story, everybody expected to hear Jesus say, and the father drove his son out of the house. But that's not what he did. The father divided his life, his goods, between him. That's what verse 12 says. He divided his property. It's the Greek word bios. Property, bios. It's where we get the word, bios is the Greek word for life. It's where we get biology. Okay? He divided his life. Now, why would he say he divided his life? Because everyone who was part of a Jewish community that owned property believed that their property had been given to them by God. By God. So God owned it all, and they were taking care of that. A Middle Eastern son who asked for that would have been driven away, but instead this father divides his property between them. Now I want you to think about that, because you can read this story, and there are some of you in this room that are very familiar with this story. So my challenge is to give you some historic nuances that will capture your attention. Here's one of them. Think about this. We read this story and we think, okay, fine, this boy's going to get a third of the man's wealth. So he goes down to Chase Manhattan, cashes in his CDs, and by the afternoon, he's gone. No, no. The wealth was kept in herds. He had to sell one-third of his herds, one-third of his donkeys, one-third of his sheep, one-third of his camels, one-third of his cattle, one-third of everything. And can you imagine the conversation? Elias, why are you selling a third of your cattle? Well, and he would have to tell the story of a son who rejected his love. Then he would have to sell a third of his land, a third of his crops. And he was a wealthy business owner. We'll get to that in a minute. He didn't own just a ranch and a farm. He owned businesses. And he had to sell a third of those. So how long would it take to liquidate one third of your estate in a situation like that? I don't know, three months, six months, a year? How long? Can you imagine what dinner was like with that level of tension in the family? That would be tough. So, verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together. All he had set off for a distant country, and he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, I want you to take out your card, okay? Take out 
your my mission card because everybody has a personal mission. I want you to think about this. It's not an accident that you live in the family that you're in, the neighborhood where you live, the place where you work, the friends that you have, any clubs that you're involved in. God has you there as a missionary. Who do you know that thought they were really high for a while and then they ended up very low, just like this boy? I want you to think about who the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind and write down one name, two names, three names of people whose life is coming apart. They're going through hard times, going through a divorce, going through a life-threatening illness, something that God wants to use to capture their attention. Just write down their first names only. Do that right now. <coughs> this boy finds himself without any money. He ends up feeding the pigs. He is in trouble. He thought he was on top of it. And then he ended up at the bottom of it. So what is he going to do? He's in trouble. He's out of his country. He's out of money. All he can do is feed pigs, the most detestable animal in Jewish culture. So let's pick up the story, verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, there are three things in those three verses that really stand out to us. Here's the first one. Look at verse 17. It says, he came to his senses. I want to suggest to you that sin makes us insane. You can't come to your senses unless you first leave your senses. And what does sin do to us? Sin changes our value system. Sin causes us to think that good things are bad and bad things are good. Right things are wrong and wrong things are right. Healthy things are bad and unhealthy things are good. And sin changes our value system. And it's only after we repent, have a change of our thinking, that we come to our senses. I want to suggest that sin drives us insane. Secondly, this is the first mention of God in the story. Now, the word God, the name God, is not precisely mentioned. But while this boy is sitting there starving, wanting to eat pig food, by the way, think about that. Think about that. We have hay that we feed to horses and cows, but we have a special name in the English language for pig food. What is it? Slop. Yeah, you all knew. How many of you have a picture of slop right now, a pail of slop, right? Yeah, so do I. How hungry would you have to be to eat that? I know, it's almost 1130. Just stick with me here. Lunch is coming. He is so hungry that he wants to eat that and finds himself with an open heart and he repents. And what's the first thing that he says? I'm going to go back to my father and he begins to rehearse his restoration speech to his dad. And he says, I have sinned against heaven and against you. When people repent, they're actually concerned about God's opinion of them. What God thinks of them. They're ready to repent for actions. This is the first mention of God. And here's the third thing. The rest of his speech says, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, why would he say that? When I first read this story as a young man, I didn't read hired servant. I read slave. Make me like one of your slaves. I was starving to death in this other country. Now I'm come home. It's better for me to be one of your slaves, one of your servants. At least you're going to take care of me, right? I'm going to have clothes. I'm going to have food. I'm going to have shelter. I'm not going to die. That's a better situation than I had with the pigs. That's what I thought he was saying. That's not what he is saying at all. He says, make me like one of your hired servants. We would use the word apprentice in our world. Make me an apprentice in your 
pottery shop. Make me an apprentice in your woodworking shop. Make me an apprentice in your leather shop. All those shops that you own, make me that. And now why would he do that? And here's why. Because the Jewish rabbis taught that if a son dishonored his father in the way that this son has dishonored his father, he needed to come back. He needed to repent to the father and to the whole community and, wait for it, begin to pay the father back everything that he has taken. What he is saying in that short little restoration speech is, Dad, give me a job and I'll begin to pay you back out of my wages everything that I took from you. Everybody got the picture? Okay, so we went from an arrogant young man to a humbled young man. We went from a young man that dishonored his father to a man that wants to honor his father and pay him back. Okay, that's the setting. So, verse 20. He got up, he went back to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Now when Jesus said this, the crowd gasped again. Here's why. Middle Eastern fathers don't run. They walk. Especially wealthy Middle Eastern patriarchs. Children ran. Women ran, but a wealthy patriarch would not run, and here's why. He would have to pull up his tunic and expose his legs so that when he ran, he didn't trip. A father would never run. In fact, a father in this scenario would probably stand and not move one foot towards his, fa towards his son. He would make his son come the whole way. But remember, we're getting a new picture of God here. I can just imagine every day that father out on the veranda of his house looking down the road and one day he sees a, a form heading his way and it looks like, it looks like somebody he might know and the closer he gets, that's the, that's the way my son walks. That's my son. And the father yells out, he's home, he's home. Because he didn't run out by himself. The servants came with him. And the Bible says that he ran and he embraced him. Now, look at, here's the question I want to ask you. Take out your card again one more time. Would you do that? Who do you know that used to have a sweet relationship with God that has drifted away? Somebody that you see on a regular basis, who do you know that used to go to church, now they don't? They used to pray, now they don't. They used to read their Bible, now they don't. They've walked away from faith in the same way that this boy walked away from his family and God wants to bring them back. Who do you know that's a prodigal in your life? Write down two or three names of people that you know that fit that category. All right, verse 21. He ran to his son and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father interrupts him. He will not allow him to finish. Even though the father has been publicly humiliated, he puts that behind him. He embraces his son. Verse 22. But the father said to the servants, Quick, put the best robe on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Now, that concludes part one. The father does three things. He embraces him. And then he says, quick, put sandals on his feet and a ring on his finger. Now, this is remarkable because the ring that he put on his finger was the family signet ring. Only the heirs of the father wore the ring. It was a symbol that he was an heir of the family. Do you understand what's happening here? He is looking at the boy and he is looking at everybody who works for him. And he said, I know that this kid wasted one third of my estate. And he doesn't deserve anything, but I love him. I am so grateful to have him back that he is now fully and completely restored as my son 
with one-third of my estate still to go to him. Think about that. And then he said, bring the best robe and put on him. Now, who would have owned the best robe in that house? The father would have. Bring one of my robes and put my robe on my son. Now, do I need to remind you what this boy's previous employment was? What he might have looked like? What he might have smelled like? The father brings that. And he says, put sandals on his feet. Only sons wore sandals. Servants didn't wear sandals. Well, that concludes the first half of the story. But not everybody was so happy. Look at verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son in the field came near the house and heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry, refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, and you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf. So, Father runs, greets the boy. First thing he says is, kill the fatted calf. The older brother hears music, calls the servant over. Hey, what's going on at the house? They killed the fatted calf because your brother came home. The older brother's angry and he confronts the father. Why did you kill the fatted calf? What's the deal with the calf? You ever read the Bible and go, What's the deal? This culture was 2,000 years ago, and I don't get it. Asking good questions when you read the Bible is one of the best ways to learn and grow. Here's the deal with the fatted calf. This culture did not eat meat the way you and I eat meat. We use protein, chicken, beef, fish, whatever, and we build our meal around that. Not so. They built their meals around grains, and the protein was generally used to kind of garnish the dish. So they had a fatted calf, and one family would not eat that calf. They'd have a big celebration and invite the whole community. Now, here's why. Because if you kill the calf, well, let's do a little quiz. Calves grow up to be full-grown what? And then cows give birth to what? More cows who have more cows who have more cows. Here's the deal. You kill a cow to eat it, you not only kill that one cow, you kill all the future calves it could have had. All of that is wealth, remember? So they're only going to eat meat from time to time. It was a precious delicacy. But that's not why the older brother is angry. The older brother is angry because this is the way he thought. Younger brother's gone, good. Now everything left belongs to me. Who do you think you are to kill the fatted calf that I'm in control of? You took from me. Now I want you to catch something here. The younger brother said, give me my inheritance. I don't want you, but I want your stuff. The older brother looks like he did it right. Looks like he's honoring the father, stays back and works. But when the fatted calf is killed, the older brother's angry because the older brother didn't want the father either. He only wanted his stuff. You got two boys with the same problem that are each being manifested in different ways. Now, why is that so significant? Because if you look at the very first part of this story, it says that Jesus was teaching the Pharisees and the tax collectors and the sinners in verse 1 and 2 of Luke 15. Those are the two categories. You got the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who are trying to do everything right. That's like the older brother. And then you've got the sinners and the tax collectors who are just walking their own way, doing things the way they want to do. That's like the younger brother. 
So Jesus' story walks right down the middle. Jesus is defining God as our Father. Jesus taught us to call him Father. That's what this first part of the story is all about. Secondly, I said, Jesus redefines sin. Each of these boys wanted the Father's things, but neither one of them wanted a relationship with the Father. When the younger brother did what he did, that's Jesus giving us the traditional picture of sin. We all know about sin, right? I'm going to dishonor, I'm going to disrespect, I'm going to sleep around with prostitutes, I'm going to go and throw drunken parties. Okay, so we got sexual uh, sin, we got drunkenness, we got disrespect. Okay, we can put together a pretty good sin list there. But with the older brother, how do you do that? Jesus kind of turns the tables. What was so sinful about a guy who always works hard? For the most part, respected his father. Never left home, stayed by the stuff. This is a different deal. Jesus is defining sinful action and sinful attitude. There's a huge difference there. Each one of these sons used the father to get what they wanted. One son used the father by being very good. That's the older brother. The other son used the father by being very bad. That's the younger son. But neither one of them wanted the father. They were both lost to the father. The good son was not lost because of his goodness. He was lost in spite of his goodness. The good son said, hey, I'm not going into the party. No way. I always did things right. You never honored me, never even gave me a goat for a party. But the father still goes out to the older brother. Do you notice that? That the, that the father sees the younger son coming home and he runs to him. And when the older son wouldn't come in, the father still went out to him. It's interesting here because you have two illustrations that are similar to our own culture. There are two ways people choose to live. One is moral conformity. The other one is self-discovery. Moral conformity says, I'm going to do things right. This is sometimes like people in the church. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to pray. I'm not going to sleep around. I'm always going to tell the truth. I'm going to conform to what I know God wants me to do. And the reason I do that is because I know God will bless my life if I live a good life. And then there are other people in our world that say, hey, you can't tell me what to do, especially in the Pacific Northwest where the mountain man individual is, ah, that's us. Okay, it's my money, it's my body, it's my time. I can do what I want. It's all about me. And you have this clash. So one of them says, I'm going to have a good life if I follow all the rules. The other one says, I'm going to have a good life if I do what I want to do and I don't have to answer to anybody. Now, there's a challenge with that. Because in some ways, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees like they're good church people. Going to go to church. Going to read the Bible. Going to do all those things that I know are right. And here's the challenge. If I live a good life so that I'll have a good life, then when my good life doesn't happen, who am I angry with? I'm ticked off at God. I'm angry with God. Because I did my part. God, we had a deal. It's called transactional faith. I did my part, now you do your part. The challenge with this, though, is that everybody faces tribulation. Every, everybody faces troubles. We all do. And when you're a religious person and you've lived a good life and then something bad happens, you're going to get angry at God. Why did I get fired? I go to church every week. Why did my wife get cancer? I tithe, I pray, I read my Bible. Why did my son run away? Why did I have to get divorced? Why, why, why? I did my part. You didn't come through. And Jesus is comparing this with religious people and people of the gospel. People of the gospel have problems too. People of the gospel get sick, have accidents, tragedy comes into their life, but they pray differently. Instead of being angry at God, people of the gospel say, I don't know why I got sick. I don't know why my wife left me. I don't know why my son died. But I am so glad, Jesus, that I have a friend like you who will walk through this with me. 
It's a massive difference between the two. I want you to think about this. You can't be committed to Jesus without being committed to the church. But you can be committed to the church and not be committed to Jesus. Because people who are highly committed to the church and not committed to Jesus treat church like a club. Hey, we have a club meeting every Sunday. You should hear our club president preach. He's pretty good. And we have club dues that we all pay for every And we have a little club manual. Now, you would never use language like that, but we live our life like that. We forget that we're on a mission, which is what this card is all about. So I'm going to ask you one last time to take your card out. Who do you know that has been disappointed by God or disappointed by church? They've been hurt and they feel like they've drifted away. Who do you know? I want you to write down two or three names. We're going to wrap this up here in just a minute. The Bible says here that Jesus redefines salvation. He's redefined God by God our Father, not this distant force that lives way away. He's redefined sin by not just being action, but also being attitude. And then he redefines salvation. In this story, it is so clear that God comes to us. God comes to us. He waits and looks at the young son coming home and runs to meet him. And when the older son doesn't come in, he goes out to meet him because that's what God does in our life. He goes out to meet us. So here's my last point on this. I want to challenge you. Who do you know that you would like to see come to faith? Who do you know? There's a simple way to do this. It's listed on the back of your card. I want you to turn around on the back and look at these nine arts. Nine arts of spiritual conversation. Here's the first one. Have you ever considered the fact that it's spiritual for you to notice other people? Because we live in a world where people don't notice one another. So next time you go to Fred Meyer and you're stuck in line... Notice the person in front of you. Notice the person behind you. When you're stuck at a stoplight and somebody crosses in front of you, notice that person. And then you can segue to the second spiritual art. You can begin to pray for them. Just say a prayer for them. You are now engaging God in that person's life and you don't even know them. Well, maybe you get a chance to meet them and so you start listening to them. And then the fourth skill is to ask questions and listen carefully. So there are nine skills here. I want to tell you a story about how this worked in my life, and then we're going to pray. A number of years ago, I was writing a book, working at McDonald's. It was early open. This guy sat in the booth across from me. We struck up a conversation, and uh, I heard him use the word amends. I have a background of training recovery and 12 steps, and I said to him, uh, Carl, did you just use the word amends? He said, yeah. I said, are you a 12-stepper? He said, yeah, I am. I said, me too. We instantly had something in common. We began to talk a little bit more, a little bit more. And I'm listening to him. And as I listen to him, I learn more and more about how to pray for him. Because I wanted to practice these nine arts in my own life. So I asked him, I said, Carl, What's happened in your life? What's brought you to this point? He said, man, I have been in and out of jail. I've been with 11 women. I've been married to three of them. Drugs, alcohol, all the stuff. He said, I would steal and lie. I just, just, I have a horrible thing. It started when I was a boy. My parents didn't want me. I went to live with my grandparents. At age seven, I found my grandfather who'd committed suicide at a family reunion. I'm the one that found him and his body. It just terrorized my family. It just went from one to the other to the other. I mean, he, he, it's, you get the picture, right? A messed up life. I said, do you want to keep living that way? He said, I don't. He said, what's different about you? I said, I'm not different than you. I just found Jesus. He said, that's what I need. I need Jesus in my life. 
I said, okay. So we got this little booklet by Rick Warren called the Understanding the Purpose of Your Life or Finding a Just a little thing like that. And I said, I want you to read a couple pages and underline stuff and let's meet and we'll talk about what's going on in your life every day. He said, okay. So every night he would come and sit. Now it started out that he's sitting across from me. Now he's sitting in my own booth. And he said, I, I, I don't understand that. When he would talk and explain that, and we finally came to the end of the booklet. There's this little prayer. I said, Carl, are you ready to pray and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life and to be the leader of your life? He said, I don't know how to pray. I said, well, Carl, you can pray easy. You, it's like you're talking on the phone to Jesus. I'm, I'll pray, I'll get started, and then you just talk to him the same way you talk to me. He said, talk to Jesus the same way as I talk to you? I said, exactly. And so I prayed. I said, Jesus, here's my friend Carl. He wants to follow you, and he has a prayer to pray to you. And so Carl prayed his first prayer. Carl said, Jesus, I'm here with Don. Hello. <laughs> it's what you say with people, right? He said, hello. And he said, Don said I can talk to you the same way I talk with him, and I don't have to BS with you at all. Only he didn't say BS. Okay? And we just slide right back because Jesus wants you to come however you are. And he came to Jesus, and his life was radically changed. I had breakfast with him yesterday. I've been discipling him for the last number of years. Carl, the next week, went over, and he stand by the, the garbage can. He said, my grandson, Truen, was born. He's got a hole in his heart, actually two of them. Would you pray for my grandson? We prayed for him, and God healed his grandson. He came back, and he says, wow, this prayer thing works. <laughs> the next week, his friend Paul, who was a mechanic, always worked on his cars. He said, I think, I think you should go see Paul. I said, why? Because I don't think he's ready to die. He's got cancer, and I know he's far from God. I said, Carl, but Paul doesn't know me. He said, I'm supposed to go, aren't I? I said, yeah, but I'll pray with you. I'll coach you on what to do. Just go see Paul. Tell him Jesus changed your life and then pray with him. And he said, okay. The next day he went to the hospital and he stood in front of this hospital bed and he laid out what history calls Pascal's Wager. In the 16th century, there was a guy, a theorist, a, a, a theoretical physicist and a theologian, French, by the name of Blaise Pascal. And he lays out this wager called Pascal's Wager, which basically means your whole life is one big bet. You either live your life like you believe in God and live accordingly, or you live your life like there is no God and you live accordingly. And without knowing who Pascal is at all, Carl, this guy who barely made it through the eighth grade, stood in front of his friend Paul and lays out this logical argument, and Paul says, then I need Jesus. And he led, Jesus, he led Paul to Christ on right there. He came back the next day and told me about that. He had two more friends over the next two months, Betsy and Dixie, and led them both to Christ. They both died. And he came back and said, Don, i got to ask Jesus for another ministry because everybody I talk to dies. Okay? <laughs> I want something different. Here's what I know. If you care about people and you care about Jesus, Jesus will put people in your life that need what you have. Now, I'm going to ask you one of the gutsiest questions you could ever hear right now. With every head up and every eye open, everybody looking all around. If you're willing to serve as a missionary to the people that you wrote down, that is, you're willing to pray for them, you're willing to love them, you're willing to reach out, give them a call, text them. You're just willing to do whatever Jesus tells you to do to reach them with the gospel. Then I want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask you just to stand up right where you're seated and just come right across the front. Bring your card and line right across the front. We're going to pray over everybody in your card. Okay, bring them up, right? Okay, we got 31 people that have responded, 32, right there. You didn't know I was counting, did you? Okay, just scoot on over here so you can get in here as close as you can, right? Come on up, good. Now, here's what I know. Sometime within the next six months, 
Some of these people, you might not have seen them. Jesus is going to bring them right into your life. And as soon as you see them, because you're, you're going to pray for them, this, this goes in your Bible. You pray over these people every day. You just name their name before the Lord. And what happens is God prepares your heart to talk to them, and he prepares their heart to receive from you. Some of them are going to give you a call and say, hey, can you help me move, or i got a problem, or I need to talk to somebody. I don't know what's going to happen, but over the next number of months, that's what's going to happen. I recognize that because you just made yourself available for the Spirit to work, right? So if we got 32 people, and there's an average of about four or five people, we're, we're looking at pretty close to 300 people that are going to get touched. Think about that. I, I guess it would be more like 160, 180. Sorry, my math. All right. Here's the point. This is your potential congregation. If you took a circle and drove five miles around here, we're talking about well over 100,000 people. This church isn't going to touch 100,000 people, but this church can touch another 150. Do you believe that? And five of them are your friends, or six of them, or however many they are. So I want you to hold this up before the Lord right there, okay? You are making a commitment. You are, you are taking a vow right now, a pledge. Hey, anybody here serve in the military? Give me a little wave if you served in the military. Anybody? Here? Okay, where'd you, where'd you serve? In the, we're in the army? Okay. Do you remember the day that you took the pledge? You, you kept there. Because every soldier has to raise their right hand and pledge to defend our country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, which means they're willing to die for the rest of us. That's the pledge. That's the seriousness. That's what we're doing right here. We're going to make a vow. We're going to hold this up, okay? So I want you to hold it up with your left hand and raise your right hand. And I want you to say these words with me. Jesus, I'm here today, Jesus, I'm here today. to take an, oath take an oath before you, to pray over the people on this list, pray over the on this list. to love them, to care for them, to share the gospel with them. Somebody prayed for me to find Jesus. Now I'm praying for them to find you also. Holy Spirit, use me. Empower me. Don't allow fear to hold me hostage. I choose to speak when the opportunity comes. I choose to act when the opportunity comes. And I choose to love when the opportunity comes. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray over every man and woman and child who is here today that has taken this pledge seriously. Father, I pray that they will bring folks to church with them, that they will share the gospel with them, that they will pray with them, that they will reach out. However the door opens, Lord, we have made ourselves available to reach out, to reach out. In the same way that the Father reached out to both his sons who went away from him, we choose to be used by you to do the very same thing. In Jesus' good name we pray. And everybody said out loud, Amen. 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 Take your cards and go back to your seat. Thank you, Pastor Don. Oh my goodness, what a message. <laughs> we, we are the church, Amen. Amen. And these people could be too. Yes. yes. Amen. Well, I just want to encourage you. Pastor Don talked about the prodigal sons. And one of those sons, well, both of them, they needed help. <laughs> Maybe you today, after hearing Pastor Don's message, you want to reach out to God and say, Lord, I need help. Lord, save me. Maybe today is your day. So I want to encourage you, every, every head bowed, every eye closed, is there anyone in this room or online that wants to decide today, I want to follow Jesus? Today's my day. Would you just raise your hand for me so we can see you? And if you're online, God sees you too. Amen? Amen. Well, we're just going to join together as a church. We're going to pray to Jesus, pray together. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm like those prodigal sons. I turn from my sins, and I turn to you and ask you to be my Savior, to be my Father, accepting me, running to me with open arms. And Jesus, I promise, 
I'll follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to take this list, and I'm going to put this in my Bible, and I'm committed. And I know you guys are too, amen? Amen. Well, if you did fill out a Connect card, would you just, on your way out, pop that in the little box in the back? We'd love to connect with you um, that way. And also, if today was your day and you chose to follow Jesus, please stop by the Following Jesus booth out, by, out in the lobby out there. I'll be there. I've got a book for you. We've got a course for you to take. We want to invest in you in this important part of your, of your, of your journey of faith. Amen? Amen. And then also, we need a little bit of help after service to set up for groups. It's not too much, just some chairs in here and in here, setting up some barriers. So if you are able, please stay after and speak with Jerry. I'm assigning you. <laughs> and speak with Jerry, I mean, and he'll, he'll get us all set up. Amen? All right. We love you guys. God bless. Have a good week.